What if I told you that the most guarded secret of Nazi Germany wasn't a weapon, wasn't a battle plan, but a machine? A machine so complex, so mathematically impossible to decipher that the Germans believed it was unbreakable. And yet, it was broken. Silently, invisibly, and it changed the course of World War II. For decades, this story was buried under layers of secrecy, not because it wasn't important, no, because it was too important. So classified, even generals on the front lines had no idea it was happening. So sensitive, the people who cracked the code were forbidden to speak about it until most of them were already gone. The name of the machine? Enigma. To the Nazis, it was a symbol of superiority, technological dominance, intellectual brilliance, untouchable secrecy. Every command, every U-boat movement, every military operation was encoded through Enigma. They trusted it completely. And why wouldn't they? Enigma wasn't just a typewriter with a twist. It was a monster of permutations. Three rotors, later four, each with 26 positions wired to scramble letters into unreadable noise. Add plugboard settings, rotor positions, daily keys, and you end up with over 150 quintillion possible combinations. That's more than the number of stars in the galaxy. Every day, the Germans changed the settings. Every single day. If you didn't know the exact configuration, even intercepting the messages was useless. You'd be looking at pure chaos. Imagine trying to solve a 150 quintillion piece jigsaw puzzle in 24 hours with no clues. So how do you crack something like that? You start in a place no one expected, Poland. In the early 1930s, while most of Europe was asleep to the threat of Nazi rearmament, a small group of Polish mathematicians at the Bureau Schiffru the Cipher Bureau were already working on German ciphers. Not historians, not linguists, mathematicians. They understood what Enigma was. Not a linguistic puzzle, but a mathematical one. One name stands out. Marian Rzhevsky. He, along with Jerzy Rzhitsky and Henrik Zagalski, didn't just theorize about Enigma, they rebuilt it. Using intercepted cipher keys and a bit of espionage from a French agent, they constructed a working replica of the machine. Let that sink in. Three Polish mathematicians in 1932 reverse-engineered what the world would later call the unbreakable machine. But they weren't just building models. They developed methods to read German messages regularly. They invented the Bomba, a mechanical device that could cycle through Enigma settings to find the correct daily key. It was crude by later standards, but revolutionary, and it worked. Then came 1939. War was approaching. Poland knew it wouldn't last long alone. So in July of that year, just weeks before Hitler invaded, the Polish team handed over everything replicas, methods, notes, to the British and the French. No glory, no conditions. They gave away the key to the Nazi war machine and disappeared into history. Most people today think of Alan Turing and Bletchley Park, and they should. But none of it would have been possible without the Poles. So now the torch passes to Britain. A quiet manor in the English countryside, Bletchley Park, became the nerve center of the Allied cryptographic war. Recruits arrived in secret, mathematicians, chess champions, linguists, crossword geniuses. No one told them why they were there. They signed the Official Secrets Act and got to work. Among them was a young mathematician from Cambridge, Alan Turing. Now here's where it gets brutal. The Germans upgraded Enigma. They changed rotor orders. They added complexity. The Polish methods couldn't keep up. The bomb machine had to evolve 
or the Allies would drown in encrypted noise. Turing, with help from Gordon Welchman and others, designed a new kind of machine, one that didn't try every possibility blindly, but looked for logical flaws, repeated phrases, operator habits. They called it the bomb. The bomb was massive. It clicked and clattered, scanning hundreds of combinations per second, listening for the tiniest crack in the armor. It didn't break Enigma instantly. It needed clues, cribs, common phrases like Heil Hitler or weather reports. But once it had a foothold, the whole system began to unravel. By mid-war, Bletchley was reading thousands of Nazi messages per day. But here's the catch. They couldn't act on all of them. If the Germans realized Enigma was compromised, they'd change the system, and all this, the machines, the mines, the years of work, would be for nothing. So sometimes, the Allies let attacks happen. Ships sank, lives were lost, because protecting the secret was more important than saving a convoy. How do you live with that? Imagine holding the key to stop a massacre and choosing silence. This was Operation Ultra, the secret within the secret, a classified intelligence program so sensitive that even Prime Minister Churchill described it as the goose that laid the golden eggs and never cackled. Only a handful of people outside Bletchley Park even knew it existed. Let me pause here and ask, what kind of war are we really talking about? Guns and tanks or logic and silence? Heroism isn't always on the battlefield. Sometimes it sits in front of a machine, staring down endless combinations, racing the clock, praying for a breakthrough. And yet this silent war changed everything. Let's talk about the Atlantic. For years, German U-boats had terrorized Allied shipping lanes, cutting off supplies, starving Britain, and sinking everything that floated. Convoys were slaughtered in the icy waters. The Atlantic, by 1941, had become a graveyard. Then, Ultra came online. Suddenly, the Royal Navy started showing up in the right places at the right times. U-boats began to miss their prey. Convoys slipped through narrow gaps in the wolf packs. Was it luck? Was it divine intervention? No, it was Enigma. Or rather, the messages Enigma tried and failed to hide. Allied command could read where the U-boats were headed. They could steer ships away or set traps. By 1943, the balance in the Atlantic was shifting. German naval command couldn't understand how their secure messages were being countered so precisely. They started to suspect traitors. They changed tactics, but they never suspected Enigma was broken. That secrecy wasn't luck. It was discipline. Every intercepted message had to be used carefully. The data was filtered, rephrased, and passed off as information from other sources. Recon flights, informants, radar, never the real source. This level of deception, this chess game of shadows, wasn't limited to the sea. In North Africa, the desert war between Montgomery and Rommel turned on Ultra. The Germans called him the Desert Fox. Rommel's tactics were fast, fluid, brilliant. But the Allies, reading his supply lines through Enigma, began cutting him off before he could strike. His offensive stalled. Fuel ran dry. Artillery never arrived. He was still a tactical genius, but logistics win wars. An Ultra crippled his logistics without firing a single shot. Again, the key wasn't overwhelming force. It was knowledge. Silent, invisible, devastating knowledge. And then D-Day, one of the most complex and risky operations in modern history. A million men, thousands of ships, a deception plan so massive it had its own code name, Operation Fortitude. Everything hinged on surprise, 
on convincing the Germans that Normandy was a feint, that the real invasion would happen elsewhere. Ultra gave the Allies a godlike view of German defenses, where divisions were stationed, what commanders expected, where they were moving reserves. Even after the landings, Ultra messages confirmed that Hitler was convinced Normandy was a trap. He held back reinforcements for weeks. That delay saved lives, possibly the entire campaign. But what about the cost? You see, even with Ultra, the Allies had to choose use the intelligence and risk exposure, or sacrifice lives to keep the secret. They played that game again and again. Some convoys were allowed to die. Some officers were left in the dark because Ultra had to survive. It wasn't just a tool. It was a weapon more powerful than any bomb. And like any weapon, it could backfire if revealed. So what happened after the war? Nothing, at least not publicly. The men and women of Bletchley Park went home. They found jobs, raised families, lived quiet lives, and they didn't say a word. They had saved millions, shortened the war by years, and helped build the foundations of the digital age, and no one knew, for decades. Alan Turing? He was prosecuted for homosexuality in 1952, stripped of his dignity, chemically castrated, driven to suicide. The man who arguably saved the free world died unrecognized, disgraced by the country he helped protect. His work wasn't declassified until the 1970s. Bletchley Park? Forgotten. A weed-choked estate that only historians remembered. Only in the last few decades did the truth begin to surface. The documentaries, the books, the films. The Queen granting posthumous pardon to Turing. The commemorations, the statues. But even now, most people don't realize how close we came, how fragile victory really was, and how one machine, brilliant in its design, nearly guaranteed Nazi dominance, until a few quiet minds, in a room no one was supposed to know about, turned the impossible into routine. Think about that. What if they had failed? What if Poland had never cracked the early codes? What if Turing hadn't seen the pattern? What if Ultra had been exposed in 1942? How many more millions would have died? How much longer would the war have dragged on? History is full of tanks and tyrants, battles and bloodshed, but sometimes history changes in silence, behind a locked door, in front of a blinking machine, and no one hears it happen. If this story moved you, if it made you think, then you already know why we created Hidden War Archives. These stories matter. They are the invisible threads that shaped our world. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. What surprised you the most about Ultra? Share this video with someone who still thinks wars are only won with bullets. Because sometimes, the sharpest weapon is knowing something the enemy doesn't.